Intrigue, backstabbing and secret plots. The Brexit vote was unlike anything in UK political history. People are still asking, how did they all get it so wrong? On the night of the result, the mood was pretty buoyant. Could the PM have got a better deal from the EU? Why was the Remain campaign such a disaster? And what was it like to be in the room when Britain's role in the world changed forever? We've talked to senior politicians, campaign chiefs and PR gurus to piece together the inside story of how Brexit unfolded and to look to the future. This is how Britain lost the European plot. We are approaching one of the biggest decisions this country will face in our lifetimes, whether to remain in a reformed European Union or to leave. Back to first principles, did David Cameron have to put Britain's EU future on the line? I'm afraid it'll go down as one of the worst self-inflicted um, harm that a prime minister could do to himself uh, ever in probably British political history and there was absolutely no need for it whatsoever. And having called it, he unleashed forces that he had no control over and uh, left us where we are today. Yeah, I think he made the mistake of thinking that it was in the bag and therefore not really communicating to the other EU leaders that there was any possibility of a leave vote. He was going to countries that no British Prime Minister had been to for a century. And what he was constantly saying was a warning to them, look, there is a lot of concern and Euroscepticism in Britain, and we really could leave the EU. From the pro-European point of view, George Osborne said that he was the absolutely last person to be persuaded that it was desirable or necessary. And Michael Gove, from the anti-European point of view, apparently told Cameron, for goodness sake, don't do this. You'll split the party, you'll split the country. Uh, it will have completely unpredictable uh, consequences. Don't take the risk. It became clear to me in 2012 there would be a referendum. And of course, that point when I think it was 81 Conservative MPs rebelled to try and force a referendum. So it was clear from that point there would be one. So we had to start preparing. The Brexiters began plotting their campaign in plain sight at the Tate Britain Gallery, just half a mile from Westminster. I took the view that if we met, sometimes we'd meet in the cafe here, sometimes we'd just go around and look at the, the paintings. Uh, yes, we never met a single hack or a single MP. Despite the plotting, the PM was confident he could win. David Cameron embarked on a European odyssey intended to secure a better deal for Britain in the EU, a deal he could sell in a referendum. It turned out to be an ill-fated mission. Anything that was going to be acceptable to the British people or convincing to the electorate was not acceptable to EU partners. And I think that that is still the case. I think those who say you could have got more, you could have got an emergency break or a cap on immigration, I just don't think that was realistic. I'm convinced that the day that the Leave vote won, was when the Prime Minister came back without any powers returned, without even a new treaty. And we were obviously then saying, well, look, if, the, if this is how we're treated now, before we've had the vote, how would we be treated if we voted to stay? There's a sort of industry in saying that he didn't actually get a very good deal when he went and did the renegotiation. He actually got us out of ever closer union. But what I think that our mistake probably was, was that we created a situation where people had greater expectation than was realistic. Here in Brussels, there was a general feeling that David Cameron had got a good deal, perhaps too generous a deal, and people thought he was going to win his referendum. In Brussels, we're convinced that the deal that the UK has in the EU, with a budget uh, rebate, with uh, no Schengen, no Euro, uh, justice and police cooperation and so on and so forth, it was impossible to get a better deal outside of the EU. He said that uh, he would win the referendum. And he was confident? He was be... pretty confident, yes. Diplomats tell me that at a G20 summit in Brisbane in 2014, David Cameron claimed he would win the referendum by a margin of 70-30. Did that confidence undermine his negotiating position? Could he have got a better deal? It was regarded as too generous because I remember reading the newspapers and they said you gave everything to the British and so they always have uh, some advantages in the, in the EU. 
Cameron went and asked for hardly anything and got nothing. And at that moment, I said, given that I'm asked to cast my vote, I cannot be silent and I cannot endorse it. He asked for too little. And then in the, in the end, relied on Mrs Merkel delivering more than she could ever do. She's not going to sacrifice European unity in order to help David Cameron out of an internal domestic political jam in Britain and in his own party. To come back and pretend that we'd somehow renegotiated our complete you know, terms uh, with the EU, I'm afraid, just didn't stack up. Britain's EU renegotiation was settled in February 2016 and the fight was on as the country prepared for its referendum in June. Cameron's policy chief, Oliver Letwin, was tasked with drawing up a sovereignty bill that might persuade Boris Johnson to campaign for Remain. The discussion with Boris was a very lively discussion which went on for some, some weeks um, and uh, it was a very interesting discussion. It turned out in the end but it wasn't uh, very useful because uh, we never got to the point of an agreement that we could then have tried out. One of the big unknowns really is what would have happened, particularly with Boris. I mean, I think Michael Gove was both less important and probably more predictable, but I think Boris was, the, was a big unknown going into the campaign. Pretty extraordinary in retrospect that right up until those last few days that was in doubt. He had lost Boris, but Cameron still thought he could destroy the Leave side with a barrage of warnings about the economic risks of Brexit. Quickly, the campaign got bogged down. The great uncertainty that leaving the European Union would bring. As the Prime Minister's and the Chancellor's interventions, which were sort of relentlessly sort of dire uh, in their prognostication, were not really being accepted. They weren't being embraced by people. There was a, a growing resistance of the public. that They weren't going to be bulldozed. Uh, uh, in, in this way. They weren't going to be carpet bombed uh, into uh, voting to keep Britain uh, inside the European uh, Union. The turning point came on May the 27th and the introduction of PERDA. The government machine was no longer allowed to work for the Remain side and the Leave campaign unleashed its most powerful weapon, immigration. The advantage of our proposal is that you will be able to set the right priorities for immigration when you take back control. There were one or two people on our side who were rather complacent and said at the time, we've so won this economic argument, we've forced them to go on to the immigration argument. There were those of us who felt actually it was always their game plan was to go on immigration. Then there were ministers who were told, and in no uncertain terms, not to go out and speak about it. There were uh, appearances that were cancelled by number 10. And I think all of this was deeply uh, unfortunate. David Cameron decided he could not risk taking on his opponents on the most salient issue in the campaign. David Cameron could have brought that entire debate to a complete halt by saying, I will veto the application by Turkey to become a member of the European Union. What he did is he kept saying, well, of course, the French will veto it which simply just added to our argument of saying, even to something as fundamental as Turkish application, the British Prime Minister is outsourcing that responsibility to France. Then came the decision by Cameron not to personally target Boris Johnson. And we've got right on our side. For some, it was the biggest blunder in the Brexit story. And let's make sure that June the 24th is Independence Day for Britain. Thank you very much for coming along. I was surprised they didn't go after um, Michael Gove and Boris Johnson more. So had the Remain campaign tried to sort of lash us all in together and basically say that Michael, Boris, Giesler, Andy Bamford, you know, um, James Dyson are all as bad as Nigel Farage and his friends in UKIP, that would have been terminal to us. Hello there. Hi, good. How are you? Nice to see you. Thank you very much. That's incredibly generous of you. We were reluctant to sanction blue on blue attacks for two reasons. The small one is that David Cameron wanted to bring the Conservative Party back together at the end of this, and that the more poison that was pumped into the system, that was obviously going to be a problem. But the real reason was that the more that you were dealing in attacks, you were basically feeding a beast, which meant that there would be endless media stories about who was having a go at who, who was going to 
going to be the next leader of the Conservative Party and therefore Prime Minister. And that meant that you were dragging the campaign off into other territory that is not actually about what you want to talk about, why it's sensible for Britain to stay in the EU. In desperation, Cameron and Osborne ramped up warnings of a Brexit calamity, including what Leave memorably dubbed a punishment budget. It backfired. The Remain campaign never quite managed to establish that total dominance on economic issues that every time a, an argument was made, the Leave campaign were very effective either undermining the messenger or just sowing enough doubt in people's minds. Some of the messaging, particularly towards the end, was very uh, black and white and, not, and, and less credible for that. For me, it was odd because, you know, I'm apparently the you know, one of the inventors of message discipline and keeping absolutely tight on a strategy and a, you know, and a very sort of tight-knit communications. But I never dreamed of taking it to the extent, literally, of saying absolutely nothing else about anything and simply just saying the same thing over and over and over again, especially when it manifestly wasn't working. One of the questions that Peter Mandelson really struggles with is that actually getting an influence on the Labour Party to stick to the message and stay with that message was a real problem too. So if you are a leader of the left in this country, Jeremy Corbyn or Nicola Sturgeon, and you probably think that Remain will win, there's very little in it for you to be hugely supportive of a Conservative Prime Minister who in normal day-to-day -day business is actually a mortal enemy. The murder of the Labour MP, Joe Cox, by a man shouting Britain first put the campaign on hold, but it did not change the course of history. It was the, the toxic combination of um, Joe Cox's murder with UKIP's uh, appalling breaking point um, poster. And that combination, I thought, had really taken the wind out of our sails. And there was a point that day where I really thought the, it was game over. We, there's no way we get our momentum back. And we start having that inevitable swing back to the status quo. It wasn't just... Uh morally questionable to be using that picture. It was obviously tactically disastrous for us. I'm not sure Matthew Elliott is right in thinking that vote uh, leave were the people who actually won it. I think Farage actually had a much greater impact than they're prepared to accept or admit. The poster, as I said, I think personally I wouldn't have run it if I'd have been in charge of the campaign. But nevertheless, it was relevant to what was going on uh, and it wasn't appalling at all. It reflected what's happening to this country. We got this fantastic yeah. victory despite uh, vote leave, not because of it. It's all down to UKIP and its activists. In the end, all Cameron and the Remain campaign could do was wait. On the night of the result, I had a dinner for donors uh, and in which George Osborne came and the mood was pretty buoyant. Um, we just had all the opinion polls which showed us with a clear lead, a narrow lead, but a very clear, consistent lead. George Osborne was nervous, but sort of quietly confident. And as the night went on, you kept hoping that the cities were going to sort of come to one's rescue. Uh, and they never did quite enough. And by really three in the morning, it was absolutely clear we'd lost. And by that time, the mood was bleak. Personally, I felt really desperately sad. And it was a sort of sense of almost disbelief that uh, we were doing this. And of course, the, the, it was also mixed by the fact there were a lot of young people who were really distraught and, you know, many in tears. And so it was a, it was a grim evening to, go, to finally go to bed. I argued that David should stay. We had time quietly to talk about what if, and we talked about both possibilities, obviously, as nobody was sure whether we were going to win or lose. And I, uh, I strongly argued that David should remain. Why uh, was that? Well, uh, uh, rather simple grounds, actually. I thought he was the person who was best able to be Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Um, his uh, view was, and other people in the room uh, uh, were very persuasive about this, that actually he would not be the best person to lead it at that point because he, his credibility was too uh, damaged at that moment by having been on the other side. My view very strongly was that if we lost, he was going to have to resign. And the reality was I just didn't think it would be sustainable in any way for him to stay on. And it was also the right thing to do. He didn't believe in Brexit. It would have looked um, a very strange situation if somebody who'd campaigned as hard as he had had stayed on as Prime Minister. And I also thought it was the dignified thing to do. 
Nearly six months after the vote to leave the EU, David Cameron's resignation, Michael Gove's political assassination of Boris Johnson and the anointment of Theresa May as Prime Minister, how does Brexit look now? I think what the government doesn't seem to realise is the basic asymmetry of this relationship. There are 27 of them and one of us. They have a single market in which they take huge pride and want to protect at all costs, quite rightly, uh, because economically it's so important uh, uh, for Europe. They don't want to exclude us from it. I mean, they see that we've decided to leave the European Union, but if we want to negotiate our way back, you know, we can do that, but we can't sort of have it all on our own terms. We can't have our cake and eat it. When you're a member of a club, you have some rights and you have obligations and you can't just uh, keep the rights and uh, not the obligations. I had a text message from my son who said, I won't say the first text, text message, I said, Mother, you've just taken us out of the EU, removed the Prime Minister and you're about to take trillions of the stock market. It would be useful to know what you're doing tomorrow. You're not jubilant about things like that because you know these aren't decisions which carry risks with them. But I was absolutely clear in my mind that it was the right thing to have done. I've been working for this for 26 years. I, I couldn't have been happier and I couldn't be more optimistic now. I think it's probably fair to say that in the country at large there was some sense of shell shock. And shall I tell you what that was? It's the shock of finding yourself back in control again. It's the shock of a convalescent who, bedridden for weeks, finally gets out of bed, crosses the floor, throws the door open and strides out into the garden. And there is a little moment of shock. But my goodness, it's a good shock. What Brexit will ultimately look like remains to be seen. But what is clear is that the dramatic events of 2016 have changed the course of British history.